Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Nation Magazine's 150th birthday party. We are here at the Tucson Festival of Books uh, with uh, C-SPAN Book TV viewing us. So we have some folks out across America looking on. We're delighted to have them join us. My name is John Nichols, and I write about politics for The Nation magazine. Yay. So The Nation is indeed celebrating its 150th anniversary. It's 150 years of rabble-rousing and agitating and investigating and objecting and of, you know, calling out the ugly abuses of corporate power and embracing the beauty of movements for social and economic justice. It has been a long journey of 150 years, and we decided we had to figure out where we were going to go, you know, at our pivot point for the next 150. And we decided that there, we had to accept the invitation of Terry Holpert and the Tucson Festival of Books folks because we were told that Arizona might need a little speaking truth to power. <laughs> we are, in fact, here to celebrate and, and highlight a little bit of the current work that the nation does. We don't want to spend too much time looking backward. Because while we were, in fact, founded by abolitionists in 1865, and we believe that we have held true to the, some of the best of their values and the best of their ideals, I'm afraid to report that after 150 years, we have not succeeded in all of our goals. <laughs> so it appears that we have a lot ahead of us and a lot of good work. We're so appreciative of you folks for coming out. But we also want you to know that if you're here in this room, or if you're watching on TV and you want to know a little bit more about the nation, if you use that fancy phone that you have all become so addicted to, uh, and you tap in the word nation and the number 66866, nation 66866, that will tap you into a world of enlightenment and information and uh, not too many please for subscriptions or whatever. So please do that if you can. We'd love to tell you more about the magazine. But right now, I'm going to introduce some people to you who will give you a little sense of what we're working on now and what we try to achieve. I'll introduce them quickly, and then we'll go into a little bit from them, and then your good questions. First off, uh, I think most of you probably know uh, the remarkable Katha Pollitt. Katha is one of the few people at the nation who can come here and, and hold a very erudite and thoughtful discussion about women's reproductive rights and feminism, and then the next day give a seminar on poetry, because she is that uh, diverse and wide a, a spirit, and we're very, very lucky to have her with us. She's talking about her new book, among other things, Pro, which is a defense and an embrace of uh, the struggle for and the value of uh, a society that respects women's reproductive rights and their struggles to be a part of all of what we seek as a society, but also to get comfortable with some words that a lot of people don't always say. So please welcome Katha Pollitt. <laughs> Next to her, Lee Fang. And Lee is an investigative reporter. Uh, not to cast any aspersions, but if there's anyone in the room who's ever had perhaps a question about the Koch brothers, <laughs> Lee Fang, to a greater extent than just about anybody else, and he would always be modest and shy, uh, is one of the people who really has, uh, has investigated and examined the role of billionaires and corporations and big money in warping and, frankly, undermining our democracy. And his work is absolutely essential. He's worked with The Nation for a long time. He recently joined The Intercept, which is the new project with Jeremy Scahill and others doing online investigative reporting. And just this week, 
wrote an incredible piece on how the FBI was working with local police uh, to, for some reason, investigate and, and meddle with uh, Black Lives Matter movements. And the fact of the matter is, what Lee exposes is the difficult realities that social and economic justice movements face in our society, as well as why people sometimes would rather silence dissent than embrace the wisdom of it. Ladies and gentlemen, Lee Feng. Well, we searched the country and we tried to figure out some elected official who we hadn't, we hadn't uh, found too much trouble with or we hadn't thought was <laughs> so flawed that we wouldn't let him on our panel. And we were, we were stuck with only one, and it was Congressman Raul Grijalva. <laughs> he is the co-chair of the Congressional Progressive Caucus and a gentleman that that we take great pleasure in covering. We've actually disagreed with him a few times, but the bottom line is he has to work very hard to, to make us disagree with him. And more often than not, we find that he's one of the rare people in Congress who really does, from a position of power, speak truth to power. So we are very honored to have him join us on the panel. <laughs> Kath Pollitt. Yes. Um, so the nation's a very diverse magazine, and it, it does a lot of different things. But one of the things that we always celebrate is the fact that the nation is America's oldest weekly journal of opinion. And we express opinions, but we don't like to express opinions that have been expressed too many times before. We sometimes like to push the limits and the boundaries and say things that might even be considered controversial. And anybody who is a nation reader knows that if you want controversy, you start with Kathis Collin. And uh, so I wanted to bring Kath in initially to have, her, to have you talk a little bit about the, perhaps the value or at least the usefulness of having a platform where you can express controversial and challenging opinions that may 10 years from now be conventional wisdom. Bring your mic down a little so we can hear you. Well, it's certainly a value to me. <laughs> <laughs> I love writing my column. Um, I look forward to it. I, I always feel like, oh my goodness, I don't have enough words. I don't have enough space. They should give me more space. Um, and, and now that the format is slightly different, I can go over my thousand words sometimes. And that always feels like an extra hundred words is like a whole acre. <laughs> It's like having a whole other farm to till. Um, it's very exciting. Um, yes, uh, opinions is a very important part of what the nation does. Um, and we've always had very uh, strong and powerful voices. Um, I'm so you know, happy to have as my colleague, uh, colleagues Patricia Williams, Gary Young, Eric Alterman, um, and um, uh, other people whose names have gone out of my head because I'm a little nervous, um, but they're all great. And, um, you know, for me, the fun of writing is really so important. If, if it's just really, I mean, writers love to complain. We complain all the time. But if it really was as terrible as we make out, well, why wouldn't we just go, you know, teach school or sell insurance or run that farm? Um, and what I love about it is being able to frame an argument and do my research and talk to people and try to say something that hasn't been said a million times already. Um, some of the things I do that I say I have been said a million times already, often by me. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, um, but sometimes, if you're lucky, you get to sort of come in on a, a subject of some political interest and uh, say something a little fresh and new and, that, and sort of spin things a different way. Um, and that's, that's wonderful. That's really fun. And I just love writing for the nation, which I've been doing for many, many years. And Kathy, you, when you set out to do your book, in many ways your book is a, not an extension purely of your work at the nation, but it does, it does reflect a lot on some of the things that you've written. And this is a very common thing with the nation, that Writers for the Nation actually evolve into writing a lot of books. Well, yeah. You know, if you write a thousand words week after week after week, then when you're faced with a book, it really does seem like a whole Antarctica of white to fill, <laughs> you know? Uh, and then you realize, well, wait a minute. I've, I've written about these things. I've been thinking about these things for a long time. My book is about abortion rights. Um, and 
uh, to take a deeper dive into that whole very interesting and complicated subject where you can actually make an argument at some length is just feels like such a luxury. It's so wonderful. Um, and after that, you know, I stopped complaining about my writing my column forever because to write, you know, more than 200 pages is real. That's really painful. Uh, so, um, so yeah, I mean, it's a great way having a column, a forum. The other, that's the other thing. The great thing about writing my column for the nation for me is that I get to interact with readers. Um, I feel I know who they are and they know who I am, and so. When I've written, for example, for, for a newspaper, if you write for an op-ed page of a newspaper, you have to start from ground zero. You have to explain all your language. You have to t take, you know, give the history of everything. There's so little room to actually say the thing you're trying to say by the time you finish doing all that explanatory work. Um, and the great thing about the nation is uh, that you know who you're writing for. Um, and they're very, um, my readers are very uh, forthright at uh, speaking up to me, <laughs> telling me how wrong I am. Um, and that's great. That's wonderful. I feel like it's a conversation, which is what I love. And sometimes in that conversation, um, you get friendly greetings from folks who really disagree with you. Well, yes, I do. You know, it's funny. I write a lot about abortion rights, and I used to get letters to me at The Nation that would say, Katha Pollitt abortion writer. And I would think, oh, come on, I'm so much more than that. You know, I mean, what about my poetry? <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I do get some hostile mail, but that's to be expected. If you don't get hostile mail, then you're sort of not, you're not pushing back enough, I think. Um, it's natural for people to, mostly people write when they don't like what you do. If they like it, they're just, you know, they go on and have their day. If they don't like it, it festers in their mind. They have to, can't sleep till they write to you. Um, but that's fine. That's good. That shows there's, there's um, something to talk about there. And it strikes me, one final thing here, that, that one of the great struggles in our society is that our debates tend to be so narrow that they don't actually push out toward limits and, and ask questions or, or use words that we aren't, that as a, we aren't used to hearing on major TV shows on a regular basis. And it's right, it, my sense is that, especially with your column, Katha, that one of, you, one of the things you do is challenge a lot of what other people are accepting. You wrote very controversially after 9-11. And you wrote about issues and, and stirred people up in some fundamental ways. I did. I did. That was my column about not flying the flag after 9-11. And they'll put that one on my tombstone. You know, I'm never going to... Uh, be able to escape that column, um, which I still still believe in, although if I had to do it over again, I think I might have expressed myself a little care more carefully. But we were all extremely upset, of course, after 9-11, especially in New York. Um, but yeah, um, I think at exactly the moment when everybody is being the most patriotic, is the most coming together, and all the news men on TV are wearing their American flag lapels. That's the moment when you have to challenge um, that automatic response because what happens and what we saw happen, I was completely right, which was once everybody's flying the flag, the next thing that happens, there's a war. Um, and that's what happened. And instead of having your column dropped, you continued to write for the nation. Yes, yes. And uh, <laughs> that is a very good thing. Katha Pollitt. Lee Feng. Lee um, has a lot of backstory. He uh, worked for Think Progress's uh, website or for their online work. And, uh, and not, the weird thing is I, I know full well that, that folks may know the name of the Nation magazine and you may know some columnists and writers. The interesting thing about Lee is you know exactly the work he has done, but you may not always know that he did it. And one of the things that Lee did uh, after Barack Obama was elected president, was spend the better part of a year traveling across this country and looking at how very powerful interests were seeking to undermine his presidency. Now, it's not to say that Lee was out there thinking Barack Obama was the best thing since sliced bread. That wasn't the point. What Lee does is he looks at how people meddle with the process behind screens, behind closed doors and have profound impacts on our democracy. And that's another part of what the nation does. The nation tries to not just look at the issue as it's being discussed, but to look at the structure behind it, to look at the money behind it. 
So I want to bring Lee in to, to talk a little bit about what you've done over the years, looking at, at not just the individuals, not just the, the parties and the candidates, but the real power in America and how it operates. Thank you, John. Um, and thank you to Terry and all the organizers. It's really humbling to be here, and I'm flattered to be a part of this panel. Um, and I, I really enjoyed my time with the nation and hope to continue that relationship because it's such a, a great place um, where real investigative journalism is, is, is paired with interesting commentary. Um, and it's kind of known as a liberal institution for many reasons. Um, but that hasn't prevented it from always punching up and not down. Um, not only looking at corruption on the individual level, at the politician level, but looking at the more systemic issues and, and how it structurally fits into our society. Um, and again, as it's, it's, it's viewed as uh, for the identity or their perception as, as left wing or, or whatever, but that hasn't prevented the nation from taking on sacred cows on the left. Um, I, I won't disclose it here, but there are a number of stories of, from other, um, that were rejected from other liberal magazines that then found a home at the nation. Um, and I can, I can go through a, a number of stories where the nation took a leading role in investigating the left, really. Um, I did some blog, blogging last summer on uh, net neutrality, um, this, this rule uh, that's been proposed and, and has now been solidified in the last month. And many of the largest civil rights establishments in this country took a lot of money from Comcast, Verizon, the other internet service providers, and then they went to the FCC and uh, said, we, we can't have net neutrality. And this is something they've been doing o over the years. And this is something that the nation published. Uh, again, my, my, even my former employer, the Center for American Progress, um, fantastic investigation in the pages of the nation looking at some of their corporate financing. Um, and, and, and one of the, the I need to pause you for a second here and say that, that the nation magazine publishes Leap and then sends them out sometimes to, not always personally, but, but to be around messing with other, some very, very powerful people who actually like The Nation magazine. And that's a part of what makes it work. Sure. Um, and, you know, we, we've taken a look at some of the biggest failures, too, of, of the Obama administration and taken a real critical eye that the mainstream media uh, never really uncovered and really never dug into. And one of the biggest promises of Obama as a candidate and at, even as, as president was to close the revolving door, to stop the influx of lobbyists uh, borrowing and, and taking control of key committees, of, of, of federal positions. Um, this is the, the swamp that was allegedly drained when Democrats took to Congress, but we, we never saw um, a big reform. So we had a, an investigation published around this time last year that, that I wrote, and I'm, I'm very proud of, that took a look at Obama's promises uh, on closing the revolving door, on reforming uh, lobbying, and how Everything he did, basically, uh, which can be narrowed down to a single executive order, uh, banning registered lobbyists from certain boards and, and, and in certain positions in his administration, that this actually increased the problem of the revolving door. Because what, what did the lobbying community do? They simply unregistered. So if you want to join the Obama administration, <laughs> there's, there's, there's been less transparency. If you look at the figures, the number of registered lobbyists are dropping, but the amount spent on lobbying is increasing. And a lot of that, that increased amount in spending is going on um, away from the books underground. And th this also keys into um, the, 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 the way that lobbying has become much more sophisticated. It's not just you know shoehorning a congressman in the hallway of the Capitol. It's also um, paying for public relations, advertising, paying off academics, paying think tanks, um, everything that, that, that needs to be done to um, Pedal influence, I suppose. And the, the, the larger kind of systemic thing that we also revealed in that investigation was that, you know, we've had the Lobby Disclosure Act for a number of years that says if you're going to go and, and contact members of Congress and ask them to support or oppose a bill or you're writing the legislation yourself, you're supposed to go to the Secretary of Senate, Senate. You're, you're supposed to go to the House Clerk and register your activities. Well, this law has been on the book for a very, books on for a very long time, and President Obama um, promised to increase enforcement. It's actually never been enforced ever. So if, if, you, if you're a shadow lobbyist, if you're going around and, and um, doing whatever a lobbyist does, uh, if you don't register, it doesn't matter. The Department of Justice has never lifted a finger to go after these folks. Um, uh, the, the Office of Congressional Ethics has never actually had a, a prosecution of someone who has failed to register but are acting as a lobbyist. 
And this is, um, it was, it was um, a great story, and it's prompted a little bit of, of action on the federal level to reform it, but not much has changed, <laughs> as is sometimes the case. Uh, but this is, this is uh, uh, typical for uh, a nation investigation that doesn't hold back, that's intellectually honest, and takes on the sacred cows and the big institutions in Washington. And Lee, if I can ask you just to give us a little sense. You, you, you have a wonderful book about, that, that grows at least to some extent, from your examination over a very long period of time of how health care became the issue that, that a lot of our media, our, our major media in this country covers it as, but that there's a backstory on it that even to this day, I think most people aren't aware of as regards how corporate money and corporate power influence that debate. Yeah, and this, this keys in uh, very well with what I was just talking about in terms of the sophistication of the influence industry. You know, the most important policy issue, I think, uh, objectively, of the Obama era is health reform. And really understanding how this went down is, 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 is part of this is, is, is in my book, The Machine. Um, in March of 2009, if you recall, uh, President Obama had a summit saying, you know, we're going to put our political capital into passing health reform. And they had a summit at the White House. Uh, the industry representatives from uh, the hospital association, the health insurance industri industry, uh, pharmaceuticals, they all came to the microphone and said, you know, this is going to be different. It's got not going to be like the early 90s of Clinton care. You know, we're not going to oppose the bill. We're going to work hand in hand uh, and try to pass something positive for everyone. Let let's get this problem fixed. We all agree about, you know, the uninsured, the skyrocketing costs. Let's, let's fix it together. And for the first nine or ten months of the year, um, if you looked at the mainstream media coverage, uh, whether it's the New York Times or whatever, everyone reported it as such. Well, this, this year is different. Look, this um, industry group is in favor of reform. They promised, and they're supporting the bill. The kind of arguments are partisan. Republicans don't like it. Democrats want more and that type of thing. But, you know, I had the privilege of um, really touring the country and, and seeing uh, some of the more underhanded tactics that were used against the bill, you know, going to different town halls and, and actually seeing, um, you know, th of course some of this is, uh, is, is organic. You have someone stand up, they're upset at their congressman, they, sh they shout them down, and um, that happens. But in many cases, uh, you had uh, organizers funded by industry going in and, and standing in the back of the room uh, coaching folks to attack the congressman, to, 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 sh to shout him down, and to then make a ready-for-TV moment that could derail the conversation. So it's not about, you know, sh should we, you know, change the way we import prescription drugs? Should we change the way that, uh, that Medicare Advantage is, is done? No, let's, let's have a conversation about angry people at the town halls yelling yeah. down their congressmen. So to d really derail the, the issue debate and make it more of a, of a food fight. And what we found was, you know, tracking some of these groups um, some of these individual organizers who are going to town halls to be disruptive, that, again, the, the money came back to a small group of, of industries that didn't want the bill and a few group of, of very wealthy um, political donors that, that didn't want the bill. So this is the type of in investigation that would have been perfect for the nation if I was working out there at the time. But um, uh, it's part, I think it's book. part of why we brought you in. <laughs> but you've, continu you've continued to examine. And uh, the last thing I'll, I'll bring in is, uh, it just your, it, and I know some people here may have heard the story, but I still think it's an incredibly uh, telling one about the um, the Imokali workers, and uh, yeah. I think it was yeah. in some yeah. of their protests. And yeah, we um, I wrote a feature for the Nation last summer, taking a look at how uh, the retail and fast food industry has responded to this incredible movement across the country of, of worker centers. These are not exactly labor unions. These are kind of, the labor unions are involved, but um, it's, it's community groups, it's foundations, it, and, and they're trying to figure out new organizing models for farm workers, for people who work at Walmart and other re big box retailers. And of course, there's been a lot of pushback. Um, we, we took a look at, at some of the tactics um, in terms of the, the pushback, and, and, and one quick anecdote, um, the Coalition of Immokalee Workers, are, it's, it's, a, it's a worker center that has organized uh, farm workers in Florida, uh, worked with some of the distributors, worked with the people who are actually at the register at Taco Bell or whatever, and they say, hey, there, let's get some solidarity and, and, and increase the wage for everyone. Um, obviously, <laughs> the fast food industry has not liked uh, this type of organizing, and you know, we took a look at some of the protests um, at one coalition of Immokalee workers protests, someone came with a, like a Soviet flag and started waving it, and his colleague would come and take pictures, then they'd walk around the corner, 
and they look at their BlackBerry, then they go back, and then they t they'd go wave the Soviet flag again, then, then take pictures for another time. And the, the, the activists didn't know who this person was, so we, we, we looked at them and, and looked at the, we were able to identify the person, and um, maybe not a surprise, <laughs> given the context I just gave you, but you know, they were funded by um, a, a, a fast food industry group, and this was their, their, their PR people. And you know, th th these type of, of, of strategies were then kind of laid out at a um, uh, retail uh, industry conference in Chicago la later that year, and they were bragging about the way that they could undermine the social justice message of this, of this growing movement by creating these types of distractions. Ladies and gentlemen, Lee Peng. <laughs> Congressman Grijalva, who uh, folks who are watching on book TV uh, should probably be informed that, that a substantial portion of the room are your constituents. <laughs> and, and 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 they must be the eight percent that likes their congressman. <laughs> but, uh, but, <laughs> Congressman, you most of the time when you deal with the media, you are dealing with folks that are sort of. They're not telling you much more than you know. They're probably telling you a little bit less than you know. But uh, give us a sense of of the role, the value, or perhaps the lack of value. You, you could say as you choose of having a publication there that sometimes presses you from a progressive position rather than asks you why you are a progressive. Yeah, that, uh, thank you, John, and it's uh, quite an honor to be here with Lee, Akatha, and Terry. Thank you, this is a, uh, a great opportunity to uh, talk about something really important in, 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 in the light of what we're seeing in this country where media, uh, it's become more of a controlled information system as opposed to uh, the old-fashioned clash of ideas, let people deal, uh, let people uh, begin to deal with the debate and the discourse that's so needed in democracy. It seems to be more canned, prepackaged, and delivered. And uh, uh, that's very frustrating when we're dealing with the kind of issues we're dealing with in this country. Publications like The Nation, I think, have to be acknowledged, and they do make allies uncomfortable. They make a lot of people uncomfortable, but they make allies uncomfortable uh, because they, they, they push a very necessary uh, envelope and, uh, that, that needs to be pushed in, in, in our democracy and certainly with elected officials. But one thing that, is, that I think is lacking in, in politics as we, as we speak now is consistency. And, and, uh, and I think the nation represents a, a consistent path that changes, that, uh, that moves with, with the times and the circumstances, but consistently uh, keeps, uh, keeps the philosophy and a set of values that keep going. And I think that's very important. Uh, the, 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 I think part of the, the, the lack of nurture in our democracy is, is the lack of a consistency. And that's the hardest thing for any elected official, and I include myself in that, is to be consistent. And with uh, the lack of real attention to what we're doing, uh, the lack of attention to what the historic consequences of what's being decided in Congress at this moment, with uh, and the media failing to put that historic context and consequence in front of the American people, you know, the, the, the nurture of our democracy gets a little weaker. We limit the discourse. It becomes a war of buzzwords. It becomes, how do you frame? I don't know how many times I've heard framing and messaging. I, I'm really bad at that, because after I say it three times, I get really bored, so I have to <laughs> instinctively change the whatever I've been saying. And, 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 and uh, being a practitioner, for lack of a better word, of electoral politics, because I'm an elected official, you know, the, the, the issue of, of consistency is important. And uh, the fight to, to stay out of decision making that's at the lowest common denominator. And one other thing I think the nation has been helpful to us in Congress is with the Progressive Caucus. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't come to the Progressive caucus out of some epiphany that all of a sudden 
I'm a progressive or some academic paper that I read that made me a progressive. It's instinctive. It's how you grow up and it's how you see time and history in the nation. And that's why I'm a progressive. And I, I joined the Progressive Caucus. And we're a really good group of people. God love them. And many of us are still there. But we were the symbolic no. We were the ones you could count on, on Iraq, on military spending, on intervention, on more funding for good programs. You can count on us to be a no when it, on, on issues that went the wrong way. And we were very symbolically that way. With time, we began, we f began to feel, and I did and others, the Progressive Caucus to be effective, had to provide alternatives, had to provide context to progressive values and ideas, and had to provide budgets, positions, and uh, initiatives and legislation. We've been doing that. We're getting better at it, but uh, it is also in the context that what we do, nobody knows about. Uh, I think the new media has been good to us in the way we can get our message out, not through the traditional uh, methods of getting it out. And you know, the newspapers, we have one here in Tucson. That's too bad. Uh, not, you know, not evaluating that newspaper, but that's too bad. Uh, <laughs> it's, uh, and, and news radio has disappeared. Uh, you know, uh, the public radio continues to provide breadth and a little depth to coverage here. But that, that's replicated all across the country. And so the nation and other publications and forms of media that add a broader depth to what we're talking about are so important to this democracy. And the issue of money driving, yes. Uh, I remember uh, the clash we had over the Affordable Care Act. Progressives, in, we wanted universal, single payer. We lost that. We lost that early in the process. So we went and regrouped and came with the public option. At least let's make this process competitive and have a public option in that. And after it was rejected by the Senate, we lost that too. We voted for the Affordable Care Act on the theory that it's incremental and pragmatism would get us to the next step someday. And now it seems like every day we keep fighting to retain what we have. Uh, it's not a lesson in history. It, it's not a lesson to, it, it's just the reality of the way our politics are right now. Dominated by short bursts and slogans and uh, steered by money. Uh, and the nation has continues to poke at that balloon and deflated on occasion, and that's good. It's good for the democracy, and for those of us that strive to be consistent, it's good to have them push the envelope because uh, through it all, like I said at the beginning, it's hard, the hardest thing in, in, for me in a, that I've seen in my colleagues is to be consistent. Uh, I think the American people are, are going to, at some point, have to look at historical consequences, and right now, Without the information, that's very, very hard to do. Congressman, let me take you just on one thing there. We actually gave you a bit of a hard time on uh, moving, moving off single payer yes. earlier than we thought you should. Uh, and then we gave you a hard time on the public option. And we never necessarily blamed you, but we kept uh, pushing you. And so I, you understand that the congressman appears here as somebody who hasn't always uh, got a pat on the back from the nation. Uh, but the one place where I think we did, uh, frankly, we wrote about you quite a bit, but we're also uh, quite amazed and impressed was uh, where you stood up here in Arizona on the fights over immigrant rights and the fights over what Arizona was doing uh, to limit the rights and limit protections for immigrants. And I'd like you to at least take a moment to talk about some of that struggle. Well, I, I, I think that uh, the, the point was the boycott. <laughs> And uh, I think Kath had said it. I wish I would if you had to do it over again, a little more delicately. <laughs> 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 With a different kind, I don't know. But uh, having said that, uh, you know, time passes. You, you look at the consequences of that law. You look at what it's caused to the state. 
and what, 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 by not dealing with it, the kind of social fabric rift we've seen in our nation, in our families, the danger not solving and dealing with that issue poses for us, and, and not on the weird security, zero tolerance, build 10 fences theory, but just the domestic tranquility of our nation per se. Uh, uh, retrospect, you know, I was right. <laughs> then, uh, <laughs> Congressman Raul Grijalva, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Actually, confirming why he is on a Nation magazine panel, because one of our most favorite phrases is, we were right. Um, and it's often delivered decades after the struggle. But and, and you know, the truth of the matter is, the Nation has been right. We were right about LGBT rights a long time before anybody else was. We were right to make the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. a regular contributor to our magazine in the early stages of the civil rights movement. And frankly, we were right to start talking about the fact that $7.25 an hour is not a sufficient wage. $15 an hour is a lot closer to a sufficient wage. So we like to say we were right. And we also like to say that the, con the congressman is one of the, few, one of the earlier people to realize when we are right. Um, <laughs> we're going to go to some of your questions, folks. So uh, we actually, I think in the, in the spirit of the C-SPAN operation, you go to the microphones. Is that correct? Yes. So if folks would like to, to step up and ask a question, we'd love to have your questions and you can and work your way there. And as you work your way, uh, let me just, I want to bring Katha back in for one second here, and uh, do step up to the mics and we'll put you, we'll put you on the game. But Katha, I, I'm interested in one other element too. Um, the Nation magazine at this point is spending a lot of time talking about the 2016 presidential race and yes. wrestling with uh, the, you know, frankly, the question of uh, isn't it really time that we had a woman as president of the United States? Past time. Yes. <laughs> but also with the question of whether uh, a particular woman might be the perfect choice. <laughs> and I think Sarah Palin would be good. I think. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I'll just say about that, you know, we all love Elizabeth Warren. But you know, no matter if Elizabeth Warren says 5,000 times, look, I'm not running, maybe we should listen to that. There's a certain sort of pipe dream element to all of this that as if wishing is going to change things. But um, the candidate who is ready to go and all prepared is Hillary Clinton. And I don't think Hillary Clinton is terrible. Um, <laughs> And I would rather see Hillary Clinton as president than Bernie Sanders failing to win. You know, not that he's a woman. Um, so I, I, you know, at my stage in life, I figure, this is so awful, I figure I have maybe, I don't know, 20 years more of being aware of who pre the president is. Uh, and, and I would really like to see that woman president. And I'd like her to be a Democrat, a pro-choice Democrat. Um, so uh, right now, Hillary Clinton is my best option, and I'm sticking with her. There you go. <laughs> and uh, and just to to confirm that y you're not going to easily be able to say I'm right. This guy's here. Oh, okay. <laughs> Wearing <laughs> his Run Bernie Run pin. Uh, <laughs> Bernie Sanders backer. However, I'd, I'd really like to vote for a woman president, also. Not necessarily one named Hillary, so maybe we can get Elizabeth to do it. But the um, reason I'm up here at the microphone is because uh, one of the things that I thought was the most impressive thing from the Progressive Congressional Progressive Caucus was the people's budget. And for some reason, that got next to no airtime anywhere. I'm not sure if the nation actually did or not. I hope We they have did. indeed written. In fact, our editor, Katrina Vanden uh, who is not with us here but sends her great greetings, uh, not only wrote about it, I think wrote about it for uh, the nation, 
slipped it into her Washington Post column, and I think maybe even uh, in the great brooch of all uh, etiquettes, uh, might have even mentioned it on This Week uh, on ABC. <laughs> so I, I believe we've done, we may have yes. done our part. It, it just seems to me that something that was crafted by having at least 60% support from either for something or against something. Um, so I'd like Raul and the rest of the panel to kind of weigh in on, on is it dead or can we get it back or something like that because clearly the budget priorities of the current Congress are not helping anybody, at least not the people who matter. Well, it, it, with that hardball question coming your way, Raul, <laughs> Congressman, <Yep>. uh, <laughs> So I say, I, is progressive budgets? Yeah, we're gonna. We're thank you. We're gonna roll it. We're gonna submit it and roll it out next week. Uh, the progressive caucus and it's uh, uh, the hardest decision was what catchy name to give to it. So <laughs> <laughs> that being done, it's a it's a raise for everyone, people's budget, and uh, uh, different from our Democratic caucus budget and different from the Republican budget. Uh, we deal with the reality of deficit, but we also deal with the reality of uh, the economic agenda, wage disparity, income inequality, uh, gender disparity in pay, jo the need for jobs, and uh, do it in a way that uh, just doesn't talk about cuts, it talks about raising revenue as well. And so it, it's a good budget. We. I think we didn't do a good job ourselves as members. We spent so, so much time putting it together that we didn't spend any time letting people know we had it. And uh, this time, I, uh, it's going to be a much more aggressive effort. Uh, we're going to have our time on the floor, not just five minutes. And, uh, and in fact, the Democratic Caucus budget has incorporated four or five major points, uh, transaction tax, uh, the minimum wage issues that had been part of our budget, a, works, a jobs program uh, that had been incorporated into Democratic Caucus uh, budget that they're going to present. It's an alternative. I think one of the reasons we had we got Democrats and pro progressives did well this last election. We gained eight new members in our caucus, freshmen. And uh, so uh, my point being that we got beat because he had no economic agenda. And this time around, uh, coming into 216, I think we have to have one. So we'll have a budget. It's a good one, and we hope you look at it and give us your opinion. You're good. Uh, Lee, let me bring you in on that for a second, uh, because as, as optimistic as the congressman is, it, it, you might suggest to us that, that we've got a political discourse in this country where not a lot of space is given yep. to alternative budgets and alternative ideas, especially if they, if they suggest the idea that you might want to tax rich people. <laughs> well, sure, in a money-driven system as we have, we don't give time, whether it's in, in Congress or in the media, to really solving the big problems in society. You know, what, what's interesting to me is that uh, the very first bill, I don't think this is very well known, the very first bill that was passed and signed by the president of this Congress that was seated in January, a uh, unique bill, um, because it was packaged with uh, the reauthorization with something called terrorism risk insurance. But the very first unique bill that was passed by this Congress was an exception exemption to uh, end user commodity trading. So it's basically a special gift for derivatives traders. Now I follow the 2014 midterm elections pretty closely. Um, I, I watched a lot of ads. I like watching political ads. I read the news. I don't remember a single politician talking about end user exemptions for derivatives traders. Um, and I don't remember us having a really healthy debate about it. I, don't, I didn't see any of the DC newspapers or you know, political media covering this. But this was the very first bill. And unfortunately, um, you saw a lot of lobbying activity on this. You had, they had hundreds of lobbyists working on this, on this certain measure. They had their own little uh, coalition uh, to pass this. And a lot of the lobbyists who were working on this in the previous Congress went on to become chiefs of staff to senators who um, are in office today. One of the um, biggest, uh, see, DC, has, DC media has this great um, thing where they come out every year with top hired guns of the year. So they have like an all-star of who's, who's bringing the most revenue, who's the, the, the biggest lobbyist of the year. One of the top guns of the last year, top hired guns, uh, who worked on this issue then became chief of staff to Rob Portman, senator from Ohio, 
who supported this. So, you know, the revolving door, as we talked about before, is a part of this. You know, the money is a part of this. The media's failure to, to shine a light is a problem. And, um, but fortunately, the nation covered this. <laughs> <laughs> so. Well, our dear, our, our, our old friend, uh, Alex Coburn, used to say that, you know, just sit down and imagine the most cynical thought that could possibly come into your mind. And then you pretty well presume that that's where you should begin reporting because they're probably doing it. Uh, gentlemen over here. Uh, my question follows up the, uh, the answer you've just given. Even with the goalposts moved by Congress and the Supreme Court on the fiduciary duties that people, that politicians owe and public officials owe the public, uh, in your investigation or analysis of the Koch brothers' activities, uh, have you found something which e now or by the previous standards really amount to criminality? Well, look, you know, one of the areas that uh, we, I think we're all concerned with, left and right, is this explosion of, of money yep. in campaigns. And when the Citizens United decision was handed down, it was basically done on the presumption that the so-called super PACs, the independent expenditure committees that can raise and spend unlimited amounts of money, would not coordinate with c campaigns that are still under regulation. There's still a certain amount you can give directly to a, a candidate. Because then they said, well, the Citizens United would, would go too far. You'd have politicians begging to billionaires for million-dollar contributions to their campaign. There will be a firewall in between the super PACs and the candidates. And um, the Koch brothers, among other very wealthy interests in this country have taken advantage of this new campaign landscape. The problem is uh, the main um, uh, federal regulator that's supposed to enforce this firewall has never actually investigated the problem. Uh, the, fe um, the FEC, the Federal Elections Commission, is charged with responsibility in enforcing this firewall. Um, and because they're set up to have three Democratic commissioners and three Republican commissioners, they deadlock every time. So when someone brings them incredible evidence of, of coordination, I mean, it's pretty clear from, from reading the news that the candidates go to these big donors and ask for them to, to fund these super PACs. It's, there's plenty of documentation um, to attest to that fact or to highly suggest it. We haven't had any investigations of it. So it's hard to say for a lot of this, this campaign finance stuff if they're actually breaking the law when we don't have a cop on the beat. We don't have... Yeah. Uh, the FEC looking into these issues. And look, if the, the, the Koch brothers have had these twice annual mega fundraiser events where their cohort, uh, other billionaires and, and multimillionaires who share their views and, and, and often share their lobbying priorities will go and, and, and make pledges. And they'll, they'll, they'll funnel all this money together. I guess out of the last meeting, there's that news that they're going to spend a billion dollars of their collect money in the next election cycle. Um, if these and the and the candidates attend these too, they 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 have lots of congressmen, and senators go and they give presentations and they all talk. Well, if there's supposed to be a firewall in between the super PACs and the big money and the candidates, um, it, it's it's clearly violated. I should say too that Democrats probably violated it as well. Um, but oh, yeah. for these massive big money efforts, uh, we we don't see the investigation that that, that should be done by uh, federal authorities. And I will note that the Nation magazine had a major story last fall on a gentleman named Ducey uh, <laughs> from Arizona who went out and met with the Koch brothers and told them what a good governor he would be. Um, working back and forth here, but I'm going to take this woman, then we're coming to you, sir. All right. Um, I have a question just from a heartfelt desire that the American way works and that we do make a difference in our government and that we, may, we have a place to do that. And I think the discouragement a lot of us feel is simply that when you talk about these large bulks of lobbyists, uh, wealthy people making decisions, choosing candidates, what role does our party play, for example, really in all this? It used to be you go to the convention, there would be people waving the flag, they would have created that large agenda. Is that really the way it works now, or is it more a fact that that's already been done before we get to that place? Y'all have seen it, you live it, what really works? Because it's a little bit discouraging some days. Congressman, you're a Democrat. <laughs> 
I, I, I think I, I really believe that the, the, the party, uh, my party, uh, and its role in the future is very important. But like all organizations and institutionalized organizations like the Democratic Party, uh, there's always a struggle internally and with Democrats as to <laughs> what its value and soul is going to be. And so that goes constantly. But, you know, like, uh, I still believe that that apparatus and that organization is still important to the American people. And it's still in the biggest crunches we've had in this country, whether it's economic or socially or social, uh, the Democratic Party has one, stepped up to lead this country through that. So I have that kind of historic faith and personal faith. But I also understand, and, and the net neutrality fight was a very important fight, where there's neutrality in the party. Uh, but there is a neutrality among organizations. And that was a really good win for uh, groups unaffiliated with, con with Congress in that process that brought a lot of great pressure and information to the members of Congress. Uh, I thought that was a victory for them. It was a victory, as, as my friend indicated, over organizations that have historically been aligned with us, civil rights organizations that were bought out and suddenly were against uh, the effort of these groups. Yeah. But that in, that, that outside presence, I thought to me, and there's been other similar issues like that, have been very, very uh, important. And I think it revitalizes the party. But it's a struggle internally. Uh, and uh, that's why within the full Democratic caucus in Congress, we have the De Progressive Caucus, because we feel that there are points of view that need to be at the table, and we shouldn't always be dealing with the lowest common denominator or the safest position to take. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I'll note that an immense amount of the time the nation coverage of politics is about those struggles for the souls of both parties. Yes. And, and who's putting money where. And, uh, you know, I will remind you that once upon a time, the nation had a relatively warm spot for the uh, Republican Party uh, because a, a publication founded in 1865 uh, might reflect on a Republican Party that did a lot of good stuff. And uh, so we know a little about the evolution of parties. Sometimes they evolve well, sometimes not so well. Thank you for your question. Let's bring this man in. My question is to Raul, and I'm wondering if uh, you can tell me what you think is going to happen if the Supreme Court strikes down Obamacare. Oh, 11 million people uh, that are presently insured will not be insured. Uh, I think then the, the, the whole political landscape change, changes and, and the viability of uh, rallying around single payer and beginning that movement with earnest, I think, is going to be upon us. But 11 million people will be without health care. Uh, the health delivery systems, i.e. the hospitals, are going to find a tremendous financial crunch, uh, a very hurtful financial crunch. So it's going to have a human toll and, and a huge economic and financial toll to the nation if, if the Supreme Court rules against that and uh, against the subsidy. I, uh, the number 11 million, I think, needs to be in everybody's forefront, uh -huh. having insurance that they never had before. And then number two, uh, finally, the hospitals are starting to come out of their uncompensated care crisis that they had the last two years. That'll then double down on them, and that'll be very, very bad. My friend. Yes, hello. This is a question mostly, I think, for Katha. Um, what would your ideas be, Katha, about reinvigorating the women's movement in the states and feminism in the states? And I think of organizations right here in Tucson, from Las Adelitas to groups at, for example, the University High School that has a small group of young women feminists. What advice do you have? What ideas? Well, I think that's fabulous to hear, to hear about these local groups. That's really important. And you know, I am sort of modestly encouraged because I feel that young women really are uh, becoming more interested in feminism and in a broader, in a broader kind of feminism than uh, you know, maybe was the case 10 or 15 years ago. I think reproductive justice is really important. I think the whole um, sex assault on campus issue is really important. Um, the issues that I feel are completely crucial that it's, it's sort of like everybody, you know, everybody's for it, but 
there's not a whole lot going on about it, is, um, you know, equal pay, childcare. Uh, I wrote about this in The Progressive, that all these sort of slightly boring, depressing issues that don't really move too much forward are actually essential for women's equality. If you don't have, if there is no system of, of childcare, then you are never going to get women participating in the workforce in an equal way. It's just not possible. Um, and uh, if there isn't very strong anti-sex you know, anti discrimination law that's enforced, then there's always going to be a lot of um, you know, women being pushed out of, of good and important jobs. So I, I would like to see a little more attention to the economic side of things. Um, than we are currently seeing. Um, but maybe that will happen, says she optimistically. <laughs> and speaking of optimism. Yes, I'm very optimistic. I am a writer, Denise Chavez, Fronteriza writer from Las Cruces. I'd like to thank all of you, bienvenidos, bienvenidos. to our world. Um, it's just a book festival. Let's talk about art and culture and books because our books are endangered here in the Southwest. Uh, Mr. Grijalva, Congressman Grijalva, you know of the Libro Traficante movement. They're taking the books out of our libraries, our schools. I'd like to get an update from you because there is such a fear of culture and literature and books. You look at the bestsellers, there's never any Latino books, there's never few Asian books. There's never enough in our culture to elevate are multicultural voices. And here in Arizona, we've seen that. In California, a teacher friend of mine who teaches in a bilingual school says that she can only talk for 10 or 15 minutes in Spanish. And I have gone to a school in my town that is a bilingual school, and yet they've never brought a Spanish-speaking artist to that school. I will put a message on in Spanish, buenos dias. Hasta luego, hasta pronto. And get complaints because we're in the United States and you have to speak English. And so I see racism, I see that multicultural fear and dread when people tell me all the time. One woman told me once, I love French, and I, love, I do love French, French too because my husband is French. <laughs> but I, she says, I love French, but Spanish scares me because I don't know what people are saying about me. And so this dread, this fear of multiculturalism is a permeated our landscape and it's affected Arizona, Texas, California, all of our states where our books are being pulled and banned. I'd like to get an update mm -hmm. on what is happening here in Arizona and challenge each of us in this wonderful festival to look at multicultural literature in another way. It is the voice of the heartland. It's the voice of our people, of our ancestors, of the antepasados. And uh, what's happening? What can we do to promote our multicultural voice? Thank you. Congressman? I, I, I think all of us could, but you know, I've, if, I had, if I had that, that touchstone, I would have touched it a long time ago uh, to deal with the question and the comments that you made, Denise. Uh, you know, th the sickening part about uh, the banning of books in certain high schools was that it was legislated. Mm -hmm. That a legislator, this legislature said no. The sickening part in Texas that a, a committee set up to select books decided the Dr. King, Chavez, and those were not biographies and certain literature wasn't uh, were not biographies decent enough to be part of the history curriculum, and on and on and on. And that, you know, that kind of, uh, that kind of censorship is, is when it's legislated, it's, it, it is really bad because it becomes part of a systematic thing that's going on. I, your broader question, and, and uh, I'm trying to find an example. Let me use the context of immigration, okay? Uh, I, I really believe that underneath the, the, the thin veneer of ice, on, of ice on, the, on the issue of immigration reform and what we don't, why we don't have it, is that there is a, the, the, there's a political advantage to keeping this issue unresolved so that you continue to beat the drum of fear and hate and threat, us versus them, 
it's so un-American, oh my God, what, what's happening to our country? Uh, there is also, uh, I think, driving this issue is not only the political expediency that you can use this issue, uh, but this country is demographically changing. And that reality is upon us. And I, I won't live to see the full change, but it's going to change. And as it changes, I think it's for the good. And, and, and so a lot of people react to this immigration profiling, not just in terms of it's the immigrants, but it's, it's all of us in terms of our own civil rights, and people shouldn't have that burden placed on them. I, I think as this nation evolves, and it is evolving, that as we have in the past, that the idea of a multicultural society, a diverse society, will become more and more embedded in, in, in ours. Literature, art, our expressions are part of that blending. Uh, we're not there yet. I don't have a touchstone to tell you when and, and a path and how it's going to happen, but I am totally convinced of its inevitability. I wish it was sooner than later. Congressman Raul Grijalva. We've reached, uh, it, it, we moved fast here, uh, but I do want to, uh, as we close, I think perhaps less a question than an announcement uh, from Jess Lynn Diamond, who you should all know, uh, along with Terry Holpert, who's up here in the front row and deserves a round of applause for all of her great work on the programming of the Tucson Festival of Books. Jess is the person who uh, has been organizing the 150th anniversary for the nation, and I think you've got something you want to throw in our mix. It's a question for you, John. Uh -oh. I'll be really quick. Um, but I just wanted to clarify what happens when I text the word nation to the number 66866. I just think you're going to become, <laughs> uh, you know, frankly, a better person and a brighter. <laughs> and, yeah, yeah, yeah. But you well, will, in fact, learn more about the nation and how you can connect to I it. I can't and, wait for that to happen, but I think what will actually happen is you will sign up for the yeah. free email newsletter. That's exactly right. The shamelessness of Jess Lynn Diamond. And <laughs> Brothers and sisters, let me, just before we break off here, tell you that uh, on Sunday night, there's also a lot of other programming here uh, related to the nation's 150th. On Sunday night, filmmaker Barbara Koppel, who... Uh, won the Oscar for one of her documentaries in the past, has made a documentary on The Nation magazine, and it will be debuted in the Southwest at uh, the Loft Theater. We hope uh, folks will come out for that. And also, uh, tonight, uh, some of us will be at the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers Hall at uh, 7 o'clock, 6.30, 7 o'clock tonight to talk about the great struggles of labor in the Southwest. But... Most of all, we're delighted to be here at the Tucson Festival of Books with this wonderful crowd, with Katha Pollitt, Lee Fang, and Congressman Raul Grijalva. Thanks so much for being out here.